Unbroken. Healing through storytelling. Speaking to people that I have met along my own journey that have triumphed after trauma and are now thriving. So my guest today is Jo Lightfoot, who I recently met on a podcast panel. I didn't know her before, but she shared her story with me, and I know you're going to love her too. So Jo is a professional property investor, podcaster, public speaker, and performance coach. Moving into the world of property in 2015 opened up her world to a possibility in life, which enabled her to leave her job in the public sector. She is now passionate about unlocking this possibility in others through her teaching, podcasting, and coaching. Jo's academic background is performance, which has been integral to her property success as how we show up and perform all we are in everything we do as entrepreneurs. Her mission is to help people at any stage of their personal property or business journey perform all they are at best to grow themselves and their business. Welcome Jo to Unbroken the Podcast. How are you doing? I'm really well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's lovely to have you here. So as my podcast is called Unbroken, the very first question I ask of all of my guests is what does that word unbroken mean to you? Oh God, <laughs> the first word that comes to mind when you say unbroken is like release. So it's, it's about stepping out and being, making yourself um, visible. Um, I think there is something inherently true, especially as women, that we tend to hide ourselves a lot mm -hmm. and there is something about being unbroken that suggests breaking free to me and that's I think something that I can massively relate to in my own life um so yeah I think it's being unbroken is it's not saying that you know you're fixed <laughs> in some way it's about saying you're free that's what it feels like, a freedom, a release. I, I like that definition. I don't think I've had a freedom definition from any of my guests before, but yet it is. It's like saying, well, here I am and this is me kind of thing. Yeah. So can you take me back to 2012? Yeah. Okay. So uh, 2012 was a really, really pivotal year. Um, oh, God, you know what? I'm not going to say pivotal. What an awful word. It's that <laughs> completely belittles the experience. So... Okay, um, it relates to uh, my former partner. So um, I had a massive, massive health scare. So uh, it was uh, 2012, we'd been engaged for about a year by this point. We'd met at work and it was all a lovely office romance. And, you know, we decided to get married after being together for about four years. And um, there'd been a few strange sort of, you know, noticeable behaviours that I'd seen in him, you know, we'd go off the radar occasionally, but, you know, we never really thought anything of it. And, uh, and then from nowhere, a few months uh, just before um, we hit uh, 2012, he had a seizure, just a seizure from nowhere. And I'm used to seizures because I have an epileptic brother. So, but, you know, having your partner have a fit from nowhere was really strange. And, um, a head scan was done and they discovered what's called an AVM in his head. And for anyone who doesn't know what that is, it's an arterial venous malformation. Mm -hmm. And all that means is it's like a, a tangle of, of um, arteries and veins, like a, almost like a, an aneurysm. And they behave in a very similar way because the risk with them is that they rupture, right? So we knew it was there. We had three options. Um, the neurosurgeon said you can either have it, uh, you know, glued so it sort of embolizes and goes away but it didn't really suit the kind of AVM that he had mm -hmm. you can have it um you know physically removed so open head surgery but that meant five weeks off work and at the time neither of us could afford that because I would have to care for him or you can have radio surgery which is a laser and that was kind of the long game because when they do a laser surgery it takes about between two and four years to scar over and, and obliterate and disappear. Okay. But he was young, you know, and they, and they said at the end of the day, that's the lowest risk option. Um, 
the, but you should do something because the risk of it rupturing is cumulative the older you get. So we opted for that. And we booked Alan, my, my ex-partner, we booked him in to have the radio surgery on the 8th of October, 2012. Mm -hmm. And then two days before it hemorrhaged. Mm -hmm. And that changed the course of my life forever and his. And yeah, it was a pretty traumatic how, experience. How did it affect him? What were the, the side effects? Of the well, message? initially we, we weren't, we were pretty convinced that he wasn't going to survive initially. Um, he had less than a 10% chance right. of, of making it. And I mean, that, that's always the conversation I go back to is, you know, I was sat in a waiting room and, and there was a, a gentleman in there with me who obviously had another member of his family who was unwell in hospital. And I just remember a doctor and a nurse coming into the waiting room and they asked that gentleman to step outside so they could talk to me. And a nurse, Neve, never forget her name, she sat down next to me and the doctor sat opposite me and they just said, they held my hand and they said, I'm really sorry, it's a bleed, it's all throughout his head. He's got less than a 10% chance of making it, you should call the family. And what was bizarre is an hour before it ruptured, we were supposed to be going for brunch mm -hmm. and it just, this whole world just caved in and what it did was it just put you in survival mode and I think we both went into that him on a life support machine and me sort of coordinating life in the background whilst being a support to him and the family um for months to come and um ultimately um he had to learn to walk again he went into neuro rehab mm -hmm. and given that he had less than a 10 percent chance of making it he was able to walk again he was able to talk again he was able to reintegrate into uh, a, a life again but and we were able to get married you know we got married eight months later and you can imagine that was a super emotional time but what it did what that experience did for both of us is wake us up because we'd had so many worries in our life before about money and the future and looking after our parents in their older years and as I mentioned I have a disabled brother and I've always had it in the back of my mind that looking after him will be my responsibility one day and I wasn't in a financial position to be able to to, to provide that service or that level of care so it that trauma woke us up and we just went okay so now let's do something about this let's get our life together and that led on to well a huge shift in mindset and a huge shift in life choices and we started thinking about the future of money and got into property investing so yeah quite a dramatic way to be woken up though isn't it yeah and you know what the cruel thing that nobody tells you about brain injury is that it's not the event mm -hmm. it's not it's not when the event happens whether it's a car accident or or an aneurysm or whatever it might be it's coping with the changes afterwards because even if they're subtle it's still establishing a new normal and I think where I find myself now so where are we we're sort of 2021 now um we're a long way down the line but it took five years to fully recover for both of us and to experience the brain hemorrhage in very different ways and also so what it did was it made us, even though it brought us to, together, because, you know, trauma mm -hmm. links people, but it also can break people and it changes people. And, you know, um, yeah, sadly, we ended up separating um, in, in uh, last year, in 2020, just before the pandemic. You couldn't write it. We ended up having to go into <laughs> lockdown together just as we decided to separate, which we both laugh about because we're both the best of friends now. But I think that's what made us feel the most broken i think at that point because life has thrown you a whole bunch of curveballs it's caused you to make change in your life to get your financial ducks in a row support your family and really get a rocket up your bottom but you're having to make those life changes learn a really steep learning curve whilst negotiating a new normal that you haven't quite got your head around yet either that takes five years to kind of just get your head around so it's been 
oh, I mean, that's a whistle stop tour, but yeah, it's woken me up in a lot of different ways and broken me in a lot of different ways, but it's also unbroken me in but, most ways. But it was a mutual decision, though, wasn't it, to separate? Yeah, it was. And both happier for it, mm -hmm. you know, without a doubt. And um, yeah, yeah, trauma changes you. And uh, like I say, you're always bound by it. We will always be bound by what we experience together and, you know, five years of caring for him and nurturing and, you know, that that relationship that you form, that closeness, that codependent that you form actually in a lot of strange ways because no one else shared it the way you shared it. But it also ruptures things, you know, mm -hmm. it changes the dynamic of a relationship. It, it changes your priorities. Um, so, you know, you get the good with the bad. And last year when we both made that decision to separate, Oh my goodness. I mean, you know, that version of broken, we were broken, you know, and that separation, that notion of letting go and releasing, going back to that definition I said earlier, it's like we're having to release part of what we were to embrace who we are now. And it's been very emotional. I can't lie. <laughs> With a pandemic in the background. It does sound like a real emotional roller coaster. There's so many highs, so many lows, and it's like constant really from what I'm hearing from you. Yeah. How do you stay steady in all of that? I have certain anchors that I always draw upon um, as a human being. I need to always focus on my health first and foremost and that I include my mental and my physical health in that so for me especially because when we made the decision to separate it was really really hard because that was I think it was like the start of March and then 23rd of March 2020 we all went into lockdown I mean we we got the giggles because we're like honestly you couldn't write this could you like this is insane like and we had the option of either going back to our parents and sort of dealing with that trauma <laughs> or staying together and kind of grieving our marriage under one roof which is what we opted for mm -hmm. and when you're living with somebody that you've decided to you know detach from but you're having to live in one small two-bedroom flat you need certain anchor points to get through and those for me were physical exercise so I would get up every morning and I would do an online workout and then I would go for a walk, a long walk, and I, I need escapism. That's how my brain functions. So, I listen to podcasts like mm -hmm. yours. You know, <laughs> I, I, I need to escape. Um, I do audio books. I listen to music. I live for music, and you know, music can lift your mood. It can um, reflect your mood. It can almost. It's like having a hug when you physically can't hug another human it's, being. It's very healing, isn't it? And and different music for different types of emotion. Oh. Definitely. You know, sometimes when you're feeling so sad, one one song I always listen to to pick me up out of any low mood is RuPaul's Sissy That Walk. Mm -hmm. right? I'm a big drag race fan mm -hmm. and, you know, I love the wigs, the hair, the nails, all of that stuff. And if you feel like you're just on the floor, you can't help but pick yourself up off the floor when you listen to that man sing that song. Like, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. So I would strut along the street, you know, on the way to the park, go for my walk. Um, but also eating right, um, not overindulging in, uh, you know, the vices that we all have, alcohol, food, um, but also allowing myself if, if you know, I needed to. Um, but for me, it's the biggest thing has been maintaining social contact with people, you know doing my podcast so I, I, I as you know I co-host the Property Jam podcast with um, my two stinky boy co-hosts Matt and Niall and I have to say we came together over lockdown to motivate one another stay connected to one another put positivity out there on the podcast and having that social and you know friendship connection albeit on Zoom was what got us through for sure so, I didn't realise you'd only started your podcast during lockdown as well. I thought you'd, you'd been established for a few years. We had. We'd been started beforehand. We, we launched in October 2019. So we oh, were already okay. established and we had, a, we had a, you know, some fans and we had a, a strong listenership. But it's over doubled um, since, you know, lockdown happened because I think people naturally turned more to audio. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, social connection, health focus, um, laughing. 
yeah. big fan of laughing yeah. you but know it's all of what you're saying sounds like you just practice really really good self-care it's hard especially when you've had years of kind of having to put yourself second yeah. because you had to you know it wasn't you know don't resent it don't begrudge it you know my time had to be dedicated to support supporting my partner and you became more than a partner really you were his carer as well really weren't you yeah and you know truth be told that changes the dynamic in a relationship certainly a marriage um yeah. and I think that's one of the hard parts of it is your relationship evolves into something quite different and although it's a beautiful thing still it's certainly not what it was and you and you know we worked really hard um we we did all the things that you should do when you're questioning whether or not you should kind of make or break did therapy um and you know spent a lot of time really reflecting on what it was we want out of life and the ultimate conclusion was we were in different spaces and that was in part because of the trauma that we'd endured and it had led us so Alan had wanted to take root because I think having security and safety was where his brain and body wanted him to be mm -hmm. and for me because I had been so I guess for want of a better word constrained being in that caring role I wanted to break free yeah. that's why when you said what does unbroken mean it feels about being released and being free so you're Which, both in very contrasting places really weren't you very and it's so hard to let go yeah. it's so hard to let go and that's I think my less my mission of 2021 is not only to allow myself to be free and put myself first in all the ways we were just talking about but also just let go let go I'm having to let go of a portfolio that I've built with him you know with splitting the you know assets when you get into property it gets all messy and but I want to honor it you know he he deserves his 50 percent as much as I do and you know when you let go you welcome in more so but I'm hearing that you are a carer you care for your parents you care for your disabled brother you care for your like your ex-husband so that that's hard as it's someone that has that genetic makeup to let go really isn't it I attach yeah. you know and it's not I'm I'm very aware of my attachment and it's not unhealthy attachment because I think the thing and this is this is why I love doing what I do with performance coaching because I care so deeply about the people that I work with and I'm very selective about who I work with because I need to feel a connection mm -hmm. and I'm I apply this logic in every single thing that I do one thing that life has taught me is that you must trust your intuition above all other instincts because it's there to guide you so when I've made decisions about I don't know um, a property to rent or property to buy or if I'm walking around and I'm you know viewing properties um, you know to build my portfolio I get a feeling you know it's a it's an intuition this is right this is what you want it's like a an emotional compass that has never ever truth be told steered me wrong mm -hmm. and so I'm good at reading people I'm a natural empath my superpower is my my ability to accept people without judgment but also help them shine because I care about them and their journey to perform and I think sometimes that can be painful <laughs> because well, yes, if you're empath you're open to all of it then aren't you and but it's interesting to hear you say about you know your intuition your gut so many people find that hard or they might hear it and then they ignore it and then they go oh I had a feeling I should have done that we all should be able to tune in it would be a lot healthier if we could tune into really what's speaking to us because if we tune in we already know the answers oh we do you know this is the thing and this is what I would say to your listeners like it's not something you learn yeah. it's something you've already got it's just you need to choose to listen to it or not okay and now some people feel it in different spaces in their body I, I feel it very much sort of in my heart and my stomach my stomach I don't know I mean people sort of say you know I've got a gut instinct there's a reason that saying Absolutely. exists <laughs> you feel it you feel it it leads you and so I always encourage my clients I just say listen to what it's telling you listen because if you don't take a pause let's just say you have to make a massive decision I don't know like leave a partner or make a huge life change don't rush into it listen listen to what your gut is telling you it's in there you just got to tune in 
you know, all the information that is in there. It's absolutely right. And I, I think as exactly what you said, we are born with that and somehow it gets covered up, doesn't it, by conditioning and life and judgments and all the rest of it. And it's about uncovering what is already in there, that potential, that talent for tuning into our gut. And social pressure as well, because often we find ourselves making decisions based on what everybody else wants and actually not what's best for us. And part of that is letting go as well. Yeah. You have to let go the value that you place on somebody else's, you know, um, influence, um, you know, and I include social media in that. Um, doing what you think the masses would approve of as opposed to what instinctively feels right. And from my experience, when I've gone against my instincts, my better judgment at the time, I have always regretted it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's about our inner critic though, isn't it? And, and our own judgment, you know, we say people judge us, but actually we're the ones that are our own worst judges at some of the times. So that's also about letting go, letting go of the judgments, letting go of worrying about what people think. And that's really why you're flying free. <laughs> it's true. And I think one thing that happens is on days where it's really hard to do that, where you feel like you're going against the curve, you know, you're, you're, you're paddling against the tide, um and almost you know those days where you just don't feel like you even want to get out of bed because you know it's going to be hard because you might upset somebody or you're going to make an unpopular decision um or you're just being brave and making a life change um that you worry your parents might not like or your friends will judge you on what I do in those moments where it feels overwhelming I hold my own hand mm -hmm. because if nothing else you've always got you you've mm. always got you and when you feel vulnerable just hold your own hand even if it's just for 30 seconds and tell yourself I've got you mm -hmm. I've got you and doing that and I've had to do it a lot over the past couple of years for various reasons um it's just like giving yourself a, a pep talk and a hug at the same time you know <laughs> A really good self-supporter but it's total self-love then isn't it total self-acceptance of who you are that you're exactly yes. who who you're meant to be you don't need to change anything no and trust yourself yeah. and were you worried when you did announce that you were going to divorce what people would think yeah definitely um i mean both of i'm really to be fair right i'll be i'll, I'll be honest I'm not one to care much about what people think. I've always been quite resilient in that way. And I think having a disabled brother makes you that way because, you know, when you're little, you walk down the street and it's, it's obvious he's very physically and, you know, mentally disabled. You can see it. Mm -hmm. So I was always used to kids pointing and laughing and saying, oh, you know, look at him and bullying. And I've always been the kid that just marches up and says, you know, you don't know him. And I've, I've learned since I was very little to care less what people think because they're wrong often. So I've got, I've got that real inner resilience. Um, whereas on Alan's um, side, less so, um, just different upbringing, different influences. So I think for me, the biggest thing was telling my parents because I being the empath that I am I could sense just how sad they were going to be but a lot of that is down to you to lead from the front and say we're making this life change mutually it's sad but it's also really positive because we're both going to be happier as a result of it and you're almost having to I mean what what they respond to that is entirely you can't control that they, yes. they need time to process and you know all the rest of it but you have to keep maintaining that message um and I think truth be told I struggled more with supporting my family through our decision than I did you know with my decision <laughs> but you know and, and Alan's decision because they don't they're not in it they're not living and breathing it they're kind of hearing it for the first time so there was there was just concern that you know sadness would ensue uh, which it did but has got better over time as these things do um so yeah and I know you are passionate aren't you about talking out about um people that have also experienced a brain injury not just the, the person that's experienced but for carers and for the partners to really show them a, a honest picture of what it can be really like 
Yeah, um, you know, there's so many great support groups out there. Um, you know, Headway is one of them. It's an incredible charity that supports people with brain injury, but also carers of those with brain injury, because, yeah, it does change your life. And, um, you know, not necessarily for the worst. It can bring a lot of people closer together, but the challenge is, you know, what goes on behind closed doors when you're having to adapt to a new normal and often psychological changes in your partner and, and all of a sudden you have caring responsibilities that you never had before. And like I say, that affects the dynamic. It's because just... he won't go back to being the person that he was before, will he? No. And, you know, like in some ways and in many ways, actually, he is all the better for it. He has grown as a human being. He is so emotionally evolved. It's taught him so much. Mm -hmm. But then there's the, the, the cognitive stuff, you know, the, the, the small changes, you know, visual memory, short term memory. Um, you know, being able to process certain types of information and, you know, th th those things change. And then epilepsy is a side effect, which often happens with, um, you know, uh, with brain injury as well because of scar tissue. So those things are a lot to cope with. And I just think have putting a voice to that, was, it's really strange. So well, it's kind of not strange. I suppose it's inevitable where my brother and Alan both were, they actually both got sick at the same time. So Alan ended up in the high dependency unit after he came out of intensive care. And my brother who has major epilepsy also had one of the worst seizures he's ever had in his life, just as Alan was in HDU and it happened right in front of us. So then my mother and I stood back and Alan was in HDU and then my brother Stevie was in HDU and we both just stood back and looked at the sky and went, are you kidding? Like, why would you else? <laughs> anything else? Like why, you know, when it rains, it pours and, you know, we nearly lost Stevie around that time. And, um, but what I think, what the reason I mentioned that is because when you are in those moments, you realize just how important it is to just bring it back to what's, what's important which is just looking after your own and being centered in the moment you can't think about tomorrow you can't think about yesterday all you can do is be present and cope with what's being presented to you and that's how we got through and I'm passionate about what that does to somebody witnessing something like that you know whether it's brain injury or being the sibling of someone um who has a disability and the level of responsibility that that carries too because it's hard yeah, it's, it's hard. a lot of weight you know you started by saying that you know when your parents are no longer here that you will be his carer your brother's carer that's that's quite something to live up to as well and you know madeline that's probably one of aside from the perspective that alan's brain hemorrhage gave us for me the biggest driver for getting into property and making a life change was the fact that there were four of us in that family unit Mm -hmm. Two, you know, older generation carers who, you know, my parents love Stevie and they can't let him go because they're his world, right? But I can also see Stevie needs to be let go of in order to have a life, an identity outside of the family home because that's what, that's what adults have to do. Although he's childlike, he still has to live because one day they won't be around. And my biggest fear was that something would happen to one or both of my parents and then we would be dealing with everything reactively. I'd be dealing with Stevie's trauma, I'd be dealing with my own grief or trauma and we'd have a transitional accommodation situation whilst coordinating hospital visits or funeral. And I just thought I can avoid all of this if I free myself up to have time and money to be able to dedicate to getting Stevie into a more stable long-term care environment just, you know doesn't suddenly cause a trauma to everybody and that has been my mission and my purpose and now it's what to do in property which is go down the supported living route whereby you're providing accommodation to people who need it who are vulnerable in society like my brother so that you know you can alleviate carers who are older you know siblings who are struggling to to provide the care they need to for their, for their brother or sister you've, you've really thought it all out haven't you yeah it's, it's brilliant and it's great to hear now that you are independent and you are supporting yourself financially and i know you're passionate about helping other women to you know create that for themselves as well oh god yeah and you know i speak to so many women because i teach property investing as well so and a lot of the women that come through the doors you know they, they they are at a time in their life where 
they've suddenly realized now is their time. Mm-hmm. And the reason they've realized it is because maybe their kids have suddenly grown up and, you know, they're not needed in the same way as they were as a mum, you know, and maybe they had to step back from work or maybe they're in a job, you know, where they've got the kids in childcare, they're living this professional life, but they're not at a time, they're not feeling fulfilled. And so they look to find something that they can channel their energy and effort into for financial reward, but also that sense of fulfillment. Or maybe they've gone through a divorce. So all of this is what I end up talking to all the time. And, you know, it's it's about supporting women through that transition because I'm a big believer that as human beings, we are not just one dimensional. We are so many different things. We are mothers, we are daughters, we are sisters, we are business women, we are employees. You know, we're we're having to sort of wear all these different hats. A lot of balls in the air at one time, really. Absolutely. And what people do is when they step into something new for the first time or they make change, they assume that they are nothing, that they're unqualified, that they're having to start from scratch. And what I give my clients is confidence to know, no, you are coming to something new with a whole raft of life skills. So that's what I coach. And I just get the loveliest results from it it's so it's, nice it's really about installing that self-belief isn't it and that confidence actually like we're talking a little bit like intuition you have all those skills with you all that stuff behind you that you that's brought you to this point it's all in there and it's about just unleashing that and it's and you can mm. you know you, you can I mean I've seen incredible results I had one um client the other day she's been terrified to do a video on social media and Mm -hmm. I mean absolutely terrified because she was worried if her family saw it or her colleagues saw it and they knew that she had a you know a property experience on the side that they would judge her or think badly I said no you're going to do it at night you're going to put it out there into the world shine your light all Mm -hmm. you are and then you're going to go to sleep and see what happens the next day she had over like the last time I checked was like 80 engagements and like 50 comments and it was all so amazingly positive and I was like don't tell me the world does not need to see your light shine you are incredible like let's keep performing let's get you out there so I'm so and it's a beautiful way to put it just keep shining your light because we're we're scared aren't we we kind of dim our light and we're worried that people will you know think we're showing off or this that or the other but yeah it is we we all have a unique light we all have different talents and it is about shining that light it is and my logo is actually um so i have my name joe lightfoot and then out of the eye comes a rainbow and for me that's very representative of so many things it's all your different colors as a human being let all of it shine but you've got to know what your colors are first and half of that is the battle of like actually instinctively seeing what your talents and your superpowers and your skills are then when you know what they are you know how to use them and you can apply it to your life in whatever avenue that is business pleasure whatever it might be but it takes a while to discover your own rainbow. <laughs> it does, yeah. So for anyone who's listening at the moment, uh, tell us a little bit more about your own podcast. It's all about property, isn't it? Yeah. So again, for me, everything is very much about the human side of stuff, right? We're all humans and we all go through day-to-day challenges. And Niall, Matt and I have been friends in property for a really long time. And uh, we... <laughs> We are not having conversations together about, you know, the funny stuff, the downright ludicrous things that you see when you're in property that if you told friends or family, they just wouldn't get it. Right. Or they judge you on it. So, you know, the funny thing the tenant did or like, you know, the thing that someone you saw in a viewing that you just couldn't believe, you know, Um, but also the emotional side. You know, people often get into property because they've gone through trauma or a massive life change. Um, I always say it's around the D's, divorce, debt, death. You know, you get the idea. Things bring people into property because they want to make change. Um, And also just when it goes wrong, we've, you know, we've all had such massive challenges. And what gets on our nerves is there are so many podcasts and YouTubers out there going on and on about, oh, you can make a million overnight in property and blah, blah, blah. That's rubbish because it's a blooming hard journey and you have to graft to get your portfolio off the ground especially if you're starting from scratch you know I had no money when I started so I was really doing it the hard way and so we were having these conversations um about and we were like why don't we put a microphone to this and just share it you know I wonder if people would listen so we called it property jam because we're like jamming (laughs) we're like jamming about property and it's just the three of us 
having human conversation, talking about the human side of property, it's taken off because mm -hmm. people want to hear those conversations, you know. There's the Property Jam, it's called, isn't it? It's on all platforms. All platforms. I'll stick a link in the show notes as well. Oh, thanks. I mean, it's just literally have different guests on from all different walks of life because property attracts so many different people, as you can imagine, you know, and we're all a bit mental, a bit crazy. And <laughs> we, we laugh till we cry. We've had tears, you know, it's it's very emotional, um, but it's it's a really good listen. So, yeah, it's, it's property bands and property realism. It's the human side and we love it. We get so much pleasure and joy from it. And so do our listeners. Oh, that's brilliant. Well, I think that's a really, really good place to end it. That's what you talking about, bringing the human side to everything that you do, whether that's your personal life or whether that's your business life. How can people find out more about you, Joe? Well, I'm actually building my website at the moment. So when it's up and running, it will be joelightfoot.co.uk. So actually, by the time this podcast goes it, out, it might well be up and running. I think it will be up and running. So check out my website, joelightfoot.co.uk, and you can find everything about me um, and, 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 and what I do. Also, I'm on every single social media platform, but you're probably best to catch me on LinkedIn or Instagram. Brilliant. Well, just leave to me to say thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day and speaking to me on Unbroken, the podcast. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Playing now on all the main platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher for Android, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and here. Play Unbroken, the podcast with Madeline Black.